Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Tom Morgan, and this event this evening is sponsored by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at St. Scholastica, uh, with funding, generous support from the Warner series of the Manitou Fund, and of course, the Allworth family. The lecture has also received special support from the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ever Foundation and from Mary C. Van Ever in memory of William P. Van Ever, former trustee of the college. Additional funding has been provided by the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation and Reader Weekly newspaper. Uh, so grateful to all our sponsors and supporters that make these lectures possible year after year. Uh, this year's uh, theme, as I think many of you know, has been making democracy work in this country, the United States. Uh, and so this is the fourth in a series of five uh, programs and possibly six, we're not sure, on this subject. After every lecture, we have uh, a talkback session um, in the community uh, where we can process what we hear. We always hear lots of things to think about. Um, and uh, this, for this lecture, um, I've managed to persuade Larry Goodwin, president of the College of St. Scholastica, professor of theology, and graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School to be the, uh, to be the facilitator for this, uh, this lecture's uh, talkback session, and that will be held at Pilgrim Congregational Church uh, on Tuesday next week, for 7 p.m. Uh, on 4th Street. I think you all have these flyers. Um, so we thank you very much for your support to do that, and uh, we look forward to seeing people at that. Our speaker this evening comes to us from the University of Chicago where she is the Ernest Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics, appointed in the Philosophy Department, the Law School, and the Divinity School. She is an associate in the Classics Department and the Political Science Department, a member of the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, and a board member of the Human Rights Program. She also is the founder and coordinator of the Center for Comparative Constitutionalism. Professor Nussbaum received her PhD from Harvard and is taught at Harvard, Brown and Oxford universities before coming to Chicago. From 1986 to 1993, she was a research advisor at the World Institute for Development Economics Research in Helsinki, a part of the United Nations University. She has chaired the Committee on International Cooperation, the Committee on the Status of Women, of the American Philosophical Association, and the Committee for Public Philosophy. Professor Nussbaum has been a member of the Council of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the board of the American Council of Learned Societies. She has received numerous awards, numerous awards for her essays and books and received honorary degrees from 40 colleges and universities in the United States, Canada, Asia, and Europe. In uh, 2010, she was given the Centennial Medal of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. She's an academician in the Academy of Finland. In 2009, she won the ASK Award from the German Social Science Research Council and the Henry M. Phillips Prize in Jurisprudence from the American Philosophical Society. Her many, many publications include The Frugality of Goodness, in which she confronts the fact that well-meaning individuals may deeply compromise or even negate human flourishing. Sex and social justice that proposes functional freedoms or central human capabilities as a rubric of social justice. And hiding from humanity, which questions the emotions of shame and disgust as legitimate bases for legal judgments. Her most recent work includes From Disgust to Humanity, Sexual Orientation and Constitutional Law, and Creating Capabilities, which proposes an alternative model 
for Evaluating Human Development. Her next book is slated to come out in April, New Religious Intolerance, Overcoming the Politics of Fear in an Anxious Age. And then, of course, there is the book Not for Profit, which forms the subject of this evening's talk. When Professor Nussbaum isn't thinking about philosophy, she runs half marathons and she sings classical music. Oh yes, and she has a daughter, Rachel, who is planning to enter law school in the fall. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Martha Nussbaum. Oh, thank you very much. It's really lovely to be here in Duluth and at St. Scholastica. And um, I want to thank you very much for asking me to be part of this fascinating lecture series. I only wish that I could have heard all the other lectures about democracy. I'm going to begin with a quotation from a thinker from India whom I love, who was both a philosopher and an educator. He founded a progressive school, but then later in 1928, a liberal arts-oriented university, which was one of the first of its kind uh, in, in India, and still pretty much the only one of its kind. But he was alarmed at the assault on the humanities that he saw all over the world. Already in 1917, he wrote this. History has come to a stage when the moral man, the complete man, is more and more giving way, almost without knowing it, to make room for the commercial man, the man of limited purpose. This process, aided by the wonderful progress in science, is assuming gigantic proportion and power, causing the upset of man's moral balance, obscuring his human side under the shadow of soulless organization. So that's from Rabindranath Tagore's book, Nationalism. We are in the middle of a crisis of massive proportions and grave global consequences. And I'm not talking about the global economic crisis that began in 2008. At least about that one, everyone knows that a crisis is at hand and world leaders have been working quickly and desperately to find solutions. In fact, they know that their jobs are on the line if they don't make progress towards solutions. No, I mean a crisis that's gone largely unnoticed and one that I think is likely to be over the long haul even more dangerous to the future of democratic self-government, and that is a worldwide crisis in education. Radical changes are occurring in what democratic societies teach young people, and these changes have not been well thought through. Eager for national profit, nations and their systems of education are heedlessly discarding skills that are necessary to keep democracy alive. If this trend continues, nations all over the world will soon be producing generations of useful machines rather than complete citizens who can think for themselves, criticize tradition, and understand the significance of another person's sufferings and achievements. And of course, what I'm talking about is that the humanities and the arts are being cut away, both in primary, secondary, and in college, university education, in virtually every nation of the world. Seen by policymakers as useless frills at a time when nations must cut away all useless things in order to stay competitive in the global marketplace, they're rapidly losing their place in curricula and also in the minds and hearts of parents and young people. Indeed, what I might call the humanistic aspect of science, that is the imaginative, creative aspect of basic science and the aspect of rigorous critical thinking, are also losing ground as nations prefer to pursue short-term profit by the cultivation of usely, useful, highly applied skills suited to profit making. Consider these three examples. Now they're all about higher education and that's what I will primarily focus on here, but of course similar changes are taking place in pre-college education. First, 
In the fall of the year 2006, the U.S. Department's, uh, Department of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education, headed by Bush Administration's Secretary of Education, Margaret Spellings, released a report on the state of higher education in the U.S. It was called a test of leadership charting the future of U.S. higher education. Now, this report did contain a valuable critique of unequal access to higher education, and I think it deserves to be commended for that. But when it came to subject matter, it focused entirely on education for national economic gain. It concerned itself with perceived deficiencies in science, technology, and engineering, not even, as I've said, basic scientific research, but only highly applied learning, learning that can quickly generate profit-making strategies. The humanities, the arts, and critical thinking were basically absent. By omitting them, the report strongly suggested that it would be perfectly all right to let those things wither away in favor of more useful disciplines. Second, in the fall of 2009 in Britain, the Labour government issued new guidelines for its research excellence framework, which from then on would assess all individuals and all departments in British universities. According to the new criteria, fully 25% of the grade of each individual researcher and each department would be given for the so-called impact of that person's work, by which was meant short-term measurable economic impact. So, the humanities and the arts were going to be forced to become pitchmen for a product, and they would be able to justify their claim to funding only if they could demonstrate a direct, short-term economic impact. And since that time, with the new conservative government, things have gotten far worse. All direct funding for the humanities has been cut, and numerous departments of philosophy and other humanities subjects have simply been closed. Third example, two years ago, SUNY Albany made drastic cuts in the humanities, completely closing classics, theater, and several modern languages, and severely cutting others. And of course, there are many uh, similar examples around the country. So, not to belabor the obvious, there are hundreds of examples like this, and new ones arise every day. Given that economic growth is so eagerly sought by all nations, too few questions have been posed in both richer and poorer nations about the direction of education and with it of democratic society. The profit motives suggest to most concerned politicians that engineering and technology are of crucial importance for the future health of their nations. We certainly should have no objection to good scientific and technical education, and I do not suggest that nations should stop trying to improve in that regard. My concern is that other abilities, equally crucial, are at risk of getting lost in the competitive flurry, abilities crucial to the health of any democracy internally and to the creation of a decent world culture and a robust type of global citizenship capable of addressing the world's most pressing problems. These abilities are associated with the humanities and the arts, the ability to think critically, the ability to transcend local loyalties and to approach world problems as what one might call a citizen of the world, and the ability to imagine sympathetically the predicament of another person. Now, I'm going to make my argument by pursuing a contrast that my examples have already suggested between an education for economic growth and an education for a more inclusive type of democratic citizenship. So to think about education for democratic citizenship, we have to think about what democratic nations are and what they strive for. What does it mean then for a nation to advance, to improve its quality of life? On one view, it simply means to increase its gross domestic product per capita. This measure of national success has for decades been the standard one used in development economics as though it were a good proxy for a nation's overall quality of life. So the goal of a nation, says this model of development, should be economic growth. Never mind about distribution and social equality. Never mind about the preconditions of stable democracy. Never mind about the quality of race and gender relations. Never mind about the improvement of other aspects of a human being's quality of life, such as health and education. 
One sign of what the old model leaves out is that South Africa, under apartheid, used to shoot to the top of the development tables in, under that old measure. Ignoring the staggering distributional inequalities, the brutal apartheid regime, and the health and educational deficiencies that went with it. This model of development has by now been rejected by many serious development thinkers, but it continues to dominate a lot of policy making. Proponents of the old model sometimes like to claim that the pursuit of economic growth will all by itself deliver the other good things I've mentioned, health, education, political liberty, a decrease in social and economic inequality. By now, however, examining the results of divergent experiments around the world, we can see that the old model really doesn't deliver the goods as claimed. Achievements in health and education even are actually very poorly correlated with economic growth. There are field studies that my own collaborator Amartya Sen, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998, has conducted um, comparing different Indian states, which are kind of like a, a laboratory of these divergent policies. And uh, what these show is that states that have pursued growth alone don't really have good achievements in health and education. And a state can have good achievements in health and education without it even having very robust economic growth. Nor do political and religious liberty track growth, as we can all see from the stunning success of China. So producing economic growth does not really mean producing a robust democracy, nor does it mean producing a healthy, engaged, educated population in which opportunities for a good life are available to all social classes. Still, everyone likes economic growth these days, and if anything, we see a trend toward more reliance on what I call the old paradigm, rather than toward a more complex account of what societies should be trying to achieve for their people. What kind of education does the old model of development suggest? Education for economic growth needs basic skills, literacy and numeracy. It also needs some people to have more advanced skills in computer science and technology, although equal access is not terribly important. A nation can grow very nicely while the rural poor remain illiterate and without basic computer resources, as recent events in many Indian states show. In states such as Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, we see the creation of increased GDP per capita through the education of a small technical elite who make the state attractive to foreign investment. The results of this growth do not trickle down to improve the health and well-being of the rural poor. This was always the first and most basic problem with the GDP paradigm. It neglects distribution, and it can give high marks to nations or states within nations that contain alarming inequalities. And this is very true of education. Given the nature of our information economy, nations can increase GDP without worrying very much about the distribution of education so long as they create a competent tech and business elite. After that, education for economic growth needs perhaps a very rudimentary familiarity with history and economic facts on the part of the people who are going to get past elementary education in the first place, who may well be a relatively small elite. But care will probably be taken, lest the historical and economic narrative lead to any serious critical thinking about class, about whether foreign investment is really good for the rural poor, about whether democracy can even survive when such inequalities in basic life chances obtain. So critical thinking would probably not be a very important part of education for economic growth, and it has not been in states that pursue this goal relentlessly, such as one that I've particularly studied, the Western Indian state of Gujarat, which has combined growth-related policies with totally rote learning, but worse than that, a kind of enforced docility and groupthink in the schools. Well, I've mentioned critical thinking and the role of history, but what about the arts, so often valued by democratic educators? 
An education for economic growth will, first of all, probably have contempt for that part of a child's education because it doesn't lead to enrichment. For this reason, all over the world, programs in arts and humanities at all levels are being cut away. Indian parents take pride in a child who gains admission to the Institutes of Technology and Management. They're ashamed of a child who studies literature or who wants to paint or dance or philosophize. But educators for economic growth will probably do more than ignore the arts. They will fear them, for a cultivated and developed sympathy is a particularly dangerous enemy of obtuseness, and moral obtuseness is often handy to carry out programs of economic growth that ignore inequality. Speaking of education in both India and Europe, Rabindranath Tagore said that aggressive nationalism needs to blunt the moral conscience. So it needs people who don't recognize the individual, who see the world like docile bureaucrats. Art, he said, was the great enemy of that obtuseness. And artists would never be the reliable servants of any group ideology, even a basically good one. They always ask the imagination to move beyond its usual confines, to see the world in new ways. So Tagore based his experimental school and university on the arts, and that was a radical experiment. It's deeply unpopular today, with pop politicians aiming at national economic success. So educators for economic growth will very likely campaign against the humanities and the arts as ingredients of basic education. This assault is currently taking place all over the world. How else might we think of the sort of nation and the sort of citizen that we're trying to cultivate? The primary alternative to the growth-based model in international development circles, and one with which I've been associated for many years, is known as the human development paradigm. According to this model, what is important is what opportunities, or we call them capabilities, each person has in areas ranging from life, health, bodily integrity, to political liberty, political participation, and education. This model of development begins from the fact that each and every human being possesses an inalienable human dignity. I mean, what I particularly love about your curriculum is that you also start from that idea that ought to be respected by laws and institutions. A decent nation at a bare minimum acknowledges that its citizens all have entitlements based on their dignity in this and other areas and devises strategies to get people above a threshold level of opportunity in each. Now, if a nation wants to promote that type of humane, people-sensitive democracy dedicated to respecting the human dignity of each person and to promoting opportunities for what we call in our founding document, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to each and every person, what abilities will a nation need to produce in its citizens? At least the following three seem crucial. First, the ability to deliberate well about political issues affecting the nation, to examine, reflect, argue, debate, deferring to neither tradition nor authority. Second, the ability to think about the good of a nation as a whole, not just that of one's own local clan or group, and to see one's own nation in turn as part of a complicated world order in which issues of many kinds require intelligent transnational deliberation for their resolution. And third, the ability to have concern for the lives of others, to imagine what policies of many types mean for the opportunities and the experiences of one's fellow citizens of many types and people outside one's own nation. But before we can say more about what that means for education, I think we need to understand the problems we face on the way to making young people responsible democratic citizens who might possibly take an interest in human development. So what is it about human life that makes it so hard to sustain egalitarian democratic institutions and so easy to lapse into hierarchies of various types, or even worse, 
projects a violent group animosity as a powerful group attempts to establish its supremacy. Whatever these forces are, it is ultimately against them that a true education for human development must fight. So, as I would put it, following Gandhi, it must fight the internal clash of civilizations within each person, as respect for others contends against narcissistic aggression. This internal clash of civilizations can be found in all modern societies in different ways, since all contain struggles over inclusion and equality, whether the precise locus of these struggles is in debates about immigration or the accommodation of religious, ethnic, or racial minorities, or gender equality or affirmative action. In all societies, there are forces in the human personality that militate against mutual recognition and respect, as well as forces of compassion and concern that give egalitarian democracy strong support. So what do we know by now about the forces in the personality that militate against democratic reciprocity and respect? First, we know that people have an alarmingly high level of, de of deference to authority. Psychologist Stanley Milgram showed in oft-repeated uh, experiments done in many, many different nations that experimental subjects were willing to administer what they believed to be a highly dangerous level of electric shock to people who were working for the experimenter, so long as the superintending scientist said to them, go ahead, you have to go on, and so on, things like that, even when the person who was allegedly getting the shock was screaming and writhing in pain, which of course was faked for the sake of the experiment, but they always went on. Another thing we know is that people have a, an alarmingly high level of deference to peer pressure. Psychologist Solomon Ash, again in classic experiments that have been replicated many times, showed that experimental subjects are willing to go against the clear evidence of their senses so long as all the other people around them, of course hired by Ash, were saying the wrong thing. So what he typically did was to show some simple perceptual question, such as is line A longer than line B, where the answer is clear. But if at least six people before the subject said the wrong thing, then the subject almost always went along and said the wrong thing. And they would later say things like, well, you know, I thought it was the other way, but of course they said the other, you know, they must be right. Or, or they would say, I was embarrassed to say something different. And so, so things like that. And both Milgram's work and Ashes have been used by historian Christopher Browning to explain the behavior of that police battalion during the Nazi era that shot large numbers of Jews. So great was the, evident, the influence of both peer pressure and authority on these young men that the ones who couldn't bring themselves to shoot Jews admitted to shame about their alleged weakness in their letters and diaries. Still other research demonstrates that apparently normal people are willing to engage in behavior that humiliates and stigmatizes if the situation is set up in a way that casts them in a dominant role and tells them that other people are their inferiors. One particularly chilling example involves school children whose teacher informs them that children with blue eyes are superior and children with brown eyes are inferior. Hierarchical and cruel behavior immediately ensues. And then, still worse, the teacher comes in the next day and says, oh, terribly sorry, I made this awful mistake. It's actually the other way around. Children with brown eyes are superior. Children with blue eyes are inferior. And, and would you think that the children who were bullied had learned anything from the pain of exclusion? No, they, it just flips, so there's bullying again, but in the other direction. Perhaps the most famous experiment of this type is Phil Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment, in which he found that subjects randomly cast in the role of prisoner and prison guard begin behaving differently right away. The prisoners become passive and depressed, the guards use their power to humiliate and stigmatize. Other research on disgust, on which I've drawn in writing the book that, that uh, Tom mentioned in the introduction, 
uh, about the role of disgust and social inequality, shows that people are very uncomfortable with the signs of their own animality and mortality. Disgust is the emotion that polices the boundary between ourselves and other animals. In virtually all societies, it's not enough to keep ourselves free from contamination by bodily waste products that are, in the language of the psychologists who do this research, animal reminders. Instead, people create subordinate groups of human beings who are identified as disgusting, as hyper-animal, and they say that they're dirty, smelly, bearers of disease, and so on. And there's a lot of good work done on how such attitudes figure in the history of anti-Semitism, in American racism, in sexism, in discrimination against gays and lesbians. So what else do we know? We know that all these forces take on much more power when people are anonymous or are not held personally accountable. People act much worse under the shelter of anonymity as parts of a faceless mess than they do when they are watched and made accountable as distinct individuals. Second, people behave much worse when no one raises a critical voice. Ash's subjects went along with the wrong judgment when six people before them said the wrong thing. But if only one person of the six said the right thing, then almost always the subject was freed to say what he or she really believed. Third, people behave much worse when the human beings over whom they have power are dehumanized and de-individualized given, for example, a number rather than a name. And that, that was a big part of the Zimbardo prison experiment. In thinking how we might help individuals and societies to win what we might call the internal clash of civilizations in each person, we would do well to think about how these behavioral tendencies can be used to our advantage. The other side of the internal clash is a child's growing capacity for compassionate concern for seeing another person as an end and not a mere means. Paul Bloom, a very distinguished psychologist at Yale, has shown that children as young as a year old already have the capacity to assume the perspective of another person, to see the world through that person's eyes. But of course, early on, it's used very instrumentally and very narrowly. You, know, you think about your parents in order to get what you want and so on. But as concern develops, it, if all goes well, and there's a good development in the family and in the surrounding community, it can lead to an increasing wish to recognize the other as a full person with needs and entitlements of its own. So that's the challenge anyway. And as Bloom says, well, we have these innate tendencies, but all the rest is cultural. So now we have a sense of the terrain on which education goes to work. We can return to the ideas I mentioned earlier, saying a few things, very tentative and incomplete, but still radical in the present world culture about the abilities that a good education will cultivate. So three values, I want to say, are crucial to decent global citizenship. The first is the capacity for Socratic self-criticism and critical thinking about one's own traditions. As Socrates argued well before Milgram and Ash, we people do defer to others, to authority, to peer pressure. So democracy needs citizens who can think for themselves rather than deferring to others who can reason together about their choices rather than simply trading claims and counterclaims. Critical thinking is particularly crucial for good citizenship in a society that needs to come to grips with the presence of people who differ by ethnicity, class, and religion. We'll only have a chance at an adequate dialogue across boundaries like that if young people learn how to engage in dialogue and deliberation in the first place. And they'll only know how to do that if they first learn how to examine themselves and to think about the reasons why they're inclined to support one thing rather than another, rather than, as so often happens, seeing political debate as simply a way of boasting or getting an advantage for their own side. When politicians bring simplistic propaganda their way, as politicians in all times and places have a way of doing, 
Young people will only have a hope of holding the politicians accountable and preserving their own independence if they know how to think critically about what they hear, testing its logic and imagining the other side. And I think that's what Socrates basically meant by saying that he was the gadfly on the back of the democracy, which he compared to a noble but sluggish horse. So it's a good set of institutions, but it needs the sting of critical thinking to make it really do its business well. Students exposed to instruction in critical thinking learn at the same time a new attitude to those who disagree with them. They learn to see people who disagree not as opponents to be defeated like a rival sports team, but instead as rational people who have reasons for what they think. When their arguments are reconstructed, it might even turn out that they share some important premises with one's own side, and we'll both understand better where the differences come from. And we can see how this humanizes the political other, making the mind see that opposing form as a rational being who may share at least some thoughts with one's own group. One very vivid example of this that just came my way by accident was uh, a young man who was working behind the desk in the gym that I went to work out in, and he was reading Plato's Apology and Crito. So I started talking to him and kept on talking to him as he went through his philosophy class. It turned, he was in a business college, Bentley, in Waltham, Massachusetts, which wisely had required substantial liberal arts requirements of all business students, and he was in a philosophy class, which was very well taught and very well imagined, and it began with a film about the life and death of Socrates, which he said hooked him in and got him fascinated by that whole thing, that you would actually die for an argument. But then they analyzed political speeches and newspaper editorials for their logical structure, and at the end of the class, they did debates about issues of the day, and uh, Tucker was surprised to find out that he was assigned to argue against the death penalty, but he actually favored the death penalty. And he told me this was the first time in his life, and this is a very intelligent and thoughtful 19-year-old, that he understood that you could make arguments on behalf of a position that you don't hold yourself. And I think it says something about our media culture that this was the first time that conception had been brought his way. Uh, but anyway, he, he said that gave him a totally new attitude to political discussion. Now he's much more inclined to be curious about the other side and to try to figure out exactly where the differences come from. So this idea is obviously one that it's crucial to encourage from the very beginning of a child's education. And there are many, many ways to do that in schools. But obviously, in undergraduate education, we have a, a wonderful opportunity at a time when young people can think with increasing sophistication about logical structure and read works such as the Dialogues of Plato, which not because they're great books, but because they really excite people more than any other text I know about the life of argument and show what it contributes to democracy. You know, those, they can read those books and, and talk about it, engage with it, and so on. Well, of course, critical thinking is part of a curriculum, but it won't be well taught unless it informs the entire spirit of classroom pedagogy. Each participant also has to be treated as an individual whose powers of mind are unfolding, and who's expected to make an active and creative contribution to class discussion. Well, let's consider now the relevance of this ability to the current state of modern pluralistic democracies surrounded by a powerful global marketplace. First of all, we can report that even if we were just aiming at economic success, leading corporate executives and business educators report that it's very important to teach those skills in order to create corporate cultures in which critical voices are not silenced cultures of individuality and accountability. And that actually has been the case even in China and Singapore. Both in the last few years have conducted massive educational reforms to give critical thinking a new salience in the uh, school and university curriculum. However, of course, they don't really want to produce democracy. 
and therefore they don't want it to spill over into the discussion of political issues. In fact, in Singapore, they have a chilling uh, policy because students and faculty can be sued for libel if they criticize the government in a class. So anyway, they're under great uh, tension as to whether they really want to cultivate this ability. And I think it shows the importance they think it has for business culture that they're even trying. But our goal, I've said, is not simply economic growth. So let's now turn to political culture. As I've said, People are prone to be subservient to both authority and peer pressure. To prevent atrocities, we need to counteract these tendencies aggressively, producing cultures of individual dissent. By emphasizing each person's active voice, we also promote cultures of accountability. When people see their ideas as their responsibility, they're more likely to, to see their deeds as their own responsibility. The second key ability of the modern democratic citizen, I would argue, is the ability to see oneself as a member of a heterogeneous nation and world, understanding something of the history and character of the different groups that inhabit it. Knowledge is certainly not a guarantee of good behavior, but ignorance is a virtual guarantee of bad behavior. Simple cultural and religious stereotypes abound in our world, for example, the facile equation of Islam with terrorism, something I talk about in, in my new book. And the first way to begin combating these is to make sure that from a very early age, young people learn a different relation to the world. They should gradually come to understand both the differences that make understanding difficult between groups and nations, and the shared human needs and interests that make understanding essential if common problems are to be solved. This understanding of the world will promote human development only if it is itself infused by searching critical thinking, thinking that takes account of differences of power and opportunity. History will be taught not as a set of facts to be just simply digested, but as something that's an active exercise of critical attention to evidence that needs to be interpreted, decoded, turned into a narrative. So if students really learn how difficult it is to construct a historical narrative, how issues of salience and prejudice have often created bad historical narratives, they have a, a, a different understanding of history from the one that just consists in digesting facts. Well, in curricular terms, these ideas suggest that all young citizens should learn the rudiments of world history. And once again, by the time we get to undergraduate education, this can be done in a newly sophisticated way. And certainly by that time, all should get a rich and non-stereotyped understanding of the major world religions. And then, since obviously that kind of survey can't be very deep, I think that each should then learn how to inquire in more depth into at least one unfamiliar tradition. In that way, learning how to ask questions and acquiring tools that can later be used elsewhere. At the same time, they all should learn about the major traditions, majority and minority within their own nation. And all, finally, should learn at least one foreign language well seeing how another group of intelligent human beings has carved up the world subtly differently, how all so-called translation is really a kind of stammering reinterpretation, is an essential lesson in cultural humility. The third ability of the citizen, closely related to the first two, is what I would call the narrative imagination. This means the ability to think what it might be like to be in the shoes of a person different from oneself, to be an intelligent reader of that person's story, and to understand some of the emotions and wishes and desires that someone so placed might have. The cultivation of sympathy has been a key part of many modern ideas of progressive education in both Western and non-Western nations. As I've said, the moral imagination, always under siege from fear and narcissism, is that it's liable to become obtuse, if not energetically refined and cultivated through the development of sympathy and concern. Learning to see another human being not as an object for one's use, but as a full person, 
is not an automatic achievement. I mean, think again about how a small baby perceives its parents. They're objects for its use. But you have to promote the seeing of a human being by an education that refines the ability to think about what the inner life of another might be like. And also, I think very important, to understand why one can never fully grasp that inner world, why any person is always to a certain extent dark to any other, including the self to the self. The arts and the humanities can cultivate students' sympathy in many ways through engagement with many different kinds of works of literature, music, fine art, and dance. But thought needs to be given to what the student's particular blind spots are likely to be, and texts can be chosen in consequence. For all societies at all times have their particular blind spots, groups within and also groups abroad, that are particularly likely to be seen ignorantly and obtusely. Works of art can be chosen to promote criticism of that obtuseness and a more adequate vision of the unseen. Ralph Ellison, in a later essay about his great novel, Invisible Man, wrote that a novel like his could be, quote, a raft of perception, entertainment, and hope on which American culture could, quote, negotiate the snags and whirlpools that stand between us and the democratic ideal, end quote. His novel, which, by the way, has been dramatized for the stage for the first time because the estate didn't want it to, to, to be until they gave permission to the court theater on the campus of the University of Chicago. And it's an amazing production, which if you ever can get a chance to come to Chicago and see it, you should. But anyway, this novel takes the inner eyes of the white reader as its theme and its target. The hero, who's African-American, begins by saying, I am an invisible man. But then he immediately says that invisibility is not the result of a chemical accident to my epidermis, but it's a certain deficiency of the inner eyes of those I come in contact with. So the idea is it's an imaginative and educational failing on their part, not a biological accident on his. Through the imagination, we're able to have a kind of insight into the experience of another group that may be very difficult to attain in daily life, particularly when our world has constructed sharp separations and suspicions that make any encounter difficult. Now, to see how crucial the arts can be in supplying ingredients for democracy in cultures divided by both race and class, let me now consider the case of the Chicago Children's Choir. Now, this is pre-college, but still, I think this applies across the board to arts programs. Chicago contains huge economic inequalities, which translate into large differences in basic housing, employment opportunities, and educational quality. African-American and Latino neighborhoods in particular are likely not to give children anywhere near as good an education as children get in suburban white neighborhoods or in urban private schools. Such children may already have disadvantages in their homes. They may have only one parent or even no parents living at home. They may have nutritional and health deficiencies, and they may have no role models of career success, aspiration, or committed political engagement. Schools are largely segregated de facto, so students are likely to have few friends from classes and races different from their own. To make things worse, the arts, which can bring children together in non-hierarchical ways, have been very severely cut back in the public schools as part of cost-cutting measures introduced by Arne Duncan, the very man who's now our nation's Secretary of Education. Into this void has stepped the Chicago Children's Choir, an organization currently supported by private philanthropy, which by now includes around 4,000 children, approximately 80% below the poverty line, in programs of choral singing with rigorous standards of excellence. The program has three tiers. First, there are the programs in the schools, and basically those have replaced, cut music programs, and they serve 2,500 children in more than 60 different choirs in 50 elementary schools, and there's no audition required. Every, anyone can come. The in-school program, as the official description states, quote, validates the idea that music is as important as math and science 
to the development of the mind and the spirit, end quote. The second tier consists of the neighborhood choirs, six different choirs in different regions of the city. These are after school programs requiring some level of serious attendance commitment, serving children from age eight to 16. These children perform several times a year, and they then tour to different parts of the country. Children learn a wide range of music from different parts of the world, and they develop their musical skills. Finally, the most advanced level is the concert choir, one of the top youth choirs, if not the top, in the US, which has recorded numerous CDs, toured internationally, and performed with symphony orchestras and opera companies. This group performs works ranging from Bach motets to African-American spirituals. The repertory deliberately includes music from many different world cultures. The choir system was inaugurated in 1956 by Christopher Moore, a Unitarian minister, who believed that he could change young people's lives by bringing them together through music, across differences of race, religion, and class. It's grown from 24 to the current 4,000 through the dedicated support of many volunteers, and the city gives it free office space, but that's it. Such facts are easy to list. What's difficult to describe is the emotional experience of hearing these young people who do not sing like the church choirs of my youth, motionless with music held in front of them. They memorize and they act everything they sing using gesture and to some extent dance movement to put a song across. Their faces express tremendous joy in the act of singing. I've observed rehearsals of the neighborhood Hyde Park Choir and I've observed many performances of the concert choir and I've even sung with them because they do a fundraiser where you bid on the opportunity to sing with the choir and then boy, it's, it's challenging because you have to learn to dance and, and all of those things. But singers from the concert choir typically also become mentors to the younger children, giving them role models of discipline and aspiration and also developing their own ethos of social responsibility. I interviewed Molly Stone, who's the conductor of the Hyde Park Neighborhood Choir and associate conductor of the concert choir, and I asked her what, in her view, the choir contributes to democratic citizenship in Chicago. Well, she gave me a very moving set of answers. First, she said, <clears throat> the choir gives children the opportunity for an intense experience side by side with children from different racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. The experience of singing with somebody, she said, includes great vulnerability. You have to blend your breath and your body with somebody else's, and you have to make the sounds from within your own body, as would not be so directly the case even with a symphony orchestra. So, in addition, the musical experience teaches children love of their own bodies at a time when they're likely to be very uncomfortable with their bodies. So they develop a sense of Comfort, ability, discipline, and responsibility. Then, since the choirs sing music from many different world cultures, they learn about other cultures, and they learn that these cultures are available to them. They transcend barriers that expectations and stereotypes have thrown in their way, and they see that they can be world citizens. By learning to sing the music of another time and place, they also find ways of showing that they respect someone different, that they're willing to spend time learning about that other culture and taking it seriously. In all these ways, they are learning about their role in the local community and in the world, and Stone emphasized that this can lead to many forms of curiosity, as choir alums don't so much go into music, they go on to study political science, history, art, language, and so on. Three stories illustrate what Stone is talking about. One day, she said, she came into the rehearsal room of the concert choir and heard a group of African-American girls singing a complex passage of a Bach motet that they'd been rehearsing. So, she said, you're getting in some extra rehearsal time. No, they said, we're just chilling. Well, so the fact that these African-American girls from inner city schools felt so relaxed that the Bach motet was the way they would chill together, you know, showed that they 
they could be anybody. They weren't confined to black culture, whatever that is. They could claim any culture as theirs and take membership of it. Stone then remembered her own experience when she was a young singer in a predominantly African-American choir when the choir performed a Hebrew folk song. As the only Jew in the choir, she had a sudden sense of inclusion and friendship. She felt that the other kids respected her culture, wanted to study it. And finally, on a recent tour, the Hyde Park Choir went to Nashville, Tennessee, home of country music, of course, but a place whose culture and values are very foreign to urban northern Americans, whom residents of Nashville might, on their side, regard with suspicion. Hearing a country music group performing outside the Grand Old Opry, the kids recognized a country song they had learned in choir, and they surrounded the band and joined in. A celebratory expression of mutual respect and inclusion was the result. Now, I've mentioned here only the contribution the choir makes to participants. Needless to say, this contribution is multiplied many times through the effect on parents and families, on the schools, on audiences who hear the choir, both in the US and abroad. Unfortunately, such enterprises are not favored by the US educational establishment. The choir is therefore constantly in debt and is able to continue to exist only through tireless volunteer donation of both time and money. So that brings me to my concluding assessment of the current state of education for human development in our world. So how are the abilities of citizenship doing in our world today? Rather poorly. I fear. Education of the type I recommend is still doing reasonably well in the place where I first studied it, namely the liberal arts portion of US college and university curricula. Indeed, it's this part of the curriculum in institutions such as my own that particularly attracts donor support as people remember with pleasure the time when they read books that they loved for their own sake and pursued issues open-endedly. Now, however, there's increasing strain. In the New York Times, Harvard's President Drew Faust reports that the economic downturn has reinforced a picture that the value of a university degree is largely instrumental, and that university leaders, even in the Ivy League, are increasingly embracing a market model of their mission, in consequence, cutting back the liberal arts. Outside the US, many nations whose university curricula do not include a liberal arts component, and that's virtually every nation with the exception of the US, South Korea, and Scotland, are now striving to build one since they acknowledge its importance in crafting a public response to problems of pluralism, fear, and suspicion that their societies face. I've been involved in such discussions in the Netherlands, which is really moving strongly in the liberal arts direction now, in Sweden, in India, in Germany, in Italy, in India, and Bangladesh. Whether reform in this direction will occur, however, is hard to say, for liberal education has high financial and pedagogical costs. Teaching of the sort I recommend needs small classes, or at least sections, where students get copious feedback on frequent writing assignments. European professors are not trained to think this way, they think success means not having to teach undergraduates. And at present, they wouldn't do it well if they did try to do it, since they just aren't trained as teachers in the way that US graduate students are. Even when faculty are trained and are keen on the liberal arts model, politicians are often unwilling to believe that it's necessary to support the number of faculty positions required to make it really work. Meanwhile, in many nations, Politicians are imposing external demands for relevance to national economic goals before they fund departments and programs. So the universities of the world have great merits, but also great and increasing problems. By contrast, the abilities of citizenship are doing very poorly in virtually every nation in the most crucial years of children's lives, the years known as K through 12. Here, the demands of the global market have made everyone focus on technical proficiency as the key thing, and the humanities and the arts are increasingly perceived as useless, things that we can prune away to make sure that our nation remains or becomes competitive. 
To the extent that they're the focus of national discussion, they're recast as technical abilities themselves to be tested by quantitative multiple choice examinations, and the imaginative and critical abilities that are at their core are typically left aside. In the US, national testing under the No Child Left Behind Act has already made things worse, as that kind of crude testing usually does. For at least my first and third ability are not testable by a multiple choice exam, and the second, the historical one, is very poorly tested in that way. Whether a nation is aspiring to a greater share of the market like India, or struggling to protect jobs like the US, the imagination and the critical faculties are increasingly left aside. What will we have if these trends continue? Nations of technically trained people who don't know how to criticize authority, useful profit makers with obtuse imaginations. As Tagore observed, studying the educational institutions of his day, a suicide of the soul well, that's quite melodramatic and perhaps premature, but at any rate, it's a frightening thought. Indeed, when we consider the Indian state of Gujarat, on which I've written a book, which has for a particularly long time gone down this road with no critical thinking in the public schools and a concerted focus on technical proficiency, one can see clearly how a band of docile engineers can be welded by politicians into a murderous force to enact without a shred of dissent the most horrendously racist and anti-democratic policies, such as that state slaughter of more than 2,000 Muslim civilians in the year 2002, egged on by officials of state government. And yet, how can we possibly avoid going down that road? Democracies have great rational and imaginative potential. They're also prone to some serious flaws in reasoning, to parochialism, haste, and sloppiness, but worse, to deference to authority and to peer pressure. Education based mainly on profitability in the global market magnifies these deficiencies, producing a greedy obtuseness and a technically trained docility that threaten the very life of democracy itself and that certainly impede the creation of a decent world culture. If the real clash of civilizations is, as I believe, a clash within each individual person, as greed and narcissism contend against respect and compassion, all modern societies are losing the battle as they feed the forces that lead to dehumanization and fail to feed the forces that lead to cultures of concern and respect. If we do not insist on the crucial importance of the humanities and the arts, they will gradually wither away because they don't in the short term make money. They only do what is more precious than that, make a world that is worth living in, people who are able to see other human beings as full people with thoughts and feelings of their own that deserve respect and sympathy, and nations that are able to overcome fear and suspicion in favor of sympathetic and reasoned debate. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> I think they like it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, now it's time for question and answers. And the reason I'm up here now, and I won't be up here very long, is that Professor Nussbaum told me earlier that she'd be happy to answer questions all night, if need be. But she is particularly interested in having questions coming from students. So you old people, step aside and let the students go first. Uh, we, yeah, I like questions from students too, so they're particularly welcome, although all people are certainly welcome to ask questions. And in addition, uh, the evenings, the whole series is about democracy, as we all know, but uh, Professor Nussbaum has written about other things, and so she will take questions about other other matters that she's written on as well. So those are the ground rules, pretty simple. Now I'll step aside. Okay.
Okay, great. Yeah, that second is, was put in because we know, I know that in some classes you've been reading some things of mine that are not directly related to this, so feel free to ask questions about those things too. So any students, first of all? Or do you want to just think about it while others ask questions and then come forward? Yeah, okay, but please do think. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for uh, your talk. You were very eloquent and um, compelling. I heard you lament, basically over and over again, the decline of the humanities and therefore critical thinking. You blamed it essentially on economic pressures and drew a parable to Harlan Ellison's The Invisible Man. When I think of novels tied to the decline of the humanities, I think of Fahrenheit 451, I think of 1984, and I think of the animal farm. Yeah. And to blame the decline of the humanities and critical thinking in the world we live in today um, strikes me as missing the degree to which the decline is uh, governmentally induced as an intentional tool for creating a docile society, which I think we see and chastise you know, the communist countries for daily, yeah. but uh, the evidence of No Child Left Behind and other actions seems to say that we have that same thing going on here. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, I mean, I do think there are cases of that, and I do think that Gujarat in India is a case where people have set out quite deliberately to extinguish critical thinking, and they've engineered it that even Hitler is portrayed as the hero of their textbooks. And even though all over the world there have been protests against this, they won't change that because they want a certain sort of neo-fascist society that's very obedient and deferential to authority. I don't think that that's the main problem that we see in Europe and in the US, actually. I think that, you know, people are short-sighted and that they really, if, the, the reason that I focused on democracy so insistently is that I think people in these countries actually want robust democracy. And if they can really be convinced that there is a threat to the institutions that they prize, that would change their thinking. But they don't think that way. They think, oh, well, it's just the short-term profit. Now, this is partly to do with the fact that politicians are in the driver's seat in a lot of the education systems in the world. And in the US only sometimes, but certainly in some institutions they are. Um, politicians are very bad people to run an education system because their incentives are short term. They have to stand for election in two years, four years, whatever, and show what they have done. If they say, as often they do, I've created so and so many jobs for the state of such and such. You know, that's, that's a winner, winning line at the polls. But if they say, I've laid the groundwork for the long-term health of democracy, that's not a winning line at the polls in a time of economic downturn. And um, I mean, I gave a, a talk of the sort you might imagine on this topic at William & Mary, which of course is a state school, but it's a liberal arts college and where everyone supports basically what I said. And then the next day, while I was still there, they, they had this celebration of their charter and the governor, McDonald, who's been in the news so much as the potential vice presidential candidate, he came in and he gave this speech. He said, it was all sort of like what I had been criticizing so much. It was, I've created so and so many jobs for the state of Virginia and so on. And so much so that the students began to laugh because it was just like a demonstration of the thing that I had been talking about. And of course, he had no idea that he was on the campus of a liberal arts college. I don't think that had dawned on him. But in any case, um, that's the kind of incentive that any politician has, unfortunately. And I think it's true of our president as well. You know, it's not a winning line to say, I went to Occidental College and Columbia University and I was formed by the liberal arts and we better care about the, so, because people in a panic think in short-term ways. And therefore, I think 
you know, with great qualifications, and I'll say what some of those are, I've become more and more fond of private funding. It's very striking that the one country in the world that I am aware of where the humanities are marching forward is South Korea, where 70% of higher education is privately funded. And it is marching forward very impressively. I mean, there are other reasons for that, which I could go into. But, but anyway, one reason, I think, is that private donors, by and large, have different incentive structure. They are thinking about their own immortality, about what they can put their name on for posterity, about what they can give to their grandchildren, and so on. Now, that said, I think private donors really aren't always the solution that European nations that would rush out to privatize would be making a big mistake. Just to make this work, you need several things, four, four things. First of all, you need a liberal arts structure because what's important here, when I talk to our donors, I'm talking to people who are bankers, lawyers, et cetera, but they all were as undergraduates. They did the philosophical perspectives in the core. They read all the books that University of Chicago students read. And so they value that and they remember it and so on. Where you don't have that system is much harder to have financial support for the humanity. Second, they get social prestige in their group by doing this. I mean, the people who are our biggest donors do it partly in order to enhance their prestige with other rich people, but they get that because of long US traditions where social norms uh, are, are structured in a certain way. Third, tax incentives. The estate tax is the great boon of private universities because they can uh, give their money to us and then they don't lose it. And, so, so and then the fourth thing, which I think is absolutely the most important one of all, is academic control and academic autonomy. It's absolutely understood that if somebody wants to give money, they don't get to d say what's done with it beyond a very general donation to a subject area. But if they want to say how that subject should be taught or who should teach it, bye-bye, we give you back your money. And that happens. I mean, Bob Zimmer, my president, says he spends 50% of his time with donors saying no to what they want to do with their money. And I could give example after example of that. Now, where you don't have that, as in India, where there's this burgeoning private education thing, 50% of higher education is now private, a donor can set up, a corporation can set up a university in order to fatten the profit margin of that university, of, the, of that corporation. And there's a private law school that has as its president the same person who's the main donor. Now, these things would be totally unacceptable in the American system, but that's because we, we have a long tradition of academic autonomy and educational control by educators. But, so you've got to have those four things, and I think most countries don't have them. Therefore, I don't urge that other countries should rush in this direction. But I think that among our state universities, the ones that are healthy today, University of Michigan, for example, is one of the healthiest places to do the humanities in this whole country. It's because they privatized long ago when the handwriting was on the wall in Detroit. So, so anyhow, I guess what I'm saying to you is that I don't see it in quite the terms that you do. I think there are structural issues that makes, make it tough to um, cultivate the humanities in a time of economic stress. And the best way of addressing those structural issues for us, I think, happens to be a very particular kind of system of private funding, but, but that that wouldn't work elsewhere. The, there's an, another thing I want to add to that, which is that I think the humanities do better when it's just come about that national identity and national pride are linked to the humanities. If you look at two countries that have very healthy humanities, relatively speaking, Korea being one, Ireland being the other, in both cases, it's partly because they say to the world, you know, we're the nation of poets, of philosophers. Now, in the case of Korea, under the Japanese occupation, it was illegal to study Korean language or Confucian philosophy. So of course, then Koreans became very identified with that. They did it illegally, and then as an independent nation, they identify with it. Ireland, again, you know, opposed to England, we're the nation of poets and musicians and so on. And so the humanities, uh, of course, everything is 
being cut back in Ireland, but the humanities, relatively speaking, are quite popular. So anyhow, there, there are all these different tra traditional cultural structural features that play a huge role. And uh, so that doesn't give a universal recipe for fixing the problem, but I, but I think that it's rarely deliberate Orwellian domination, although, of course, that can happen. Hi. Um, as a faculty member in the humanities at a state-funded university, I'm under increasing pressure to engage in program assessment, which often involves the kind of quantitative measure or proof that students are learning what we say they're learning. Should I regard this as an intrusion of the economic development paradigm into the humanities, or is it something that, that can save the humanities if we make the argument in terms that the people asking it of us uh, make it in? Is, this, <laughs> is there a general, um, and a general bigger question about uh, if we're concerned about the prioritization of those things we can easily and quantitatively measure over those things that are harder to measure and more qualitative? Well, yeah, you know, I think there, there's a tendency that I see in lots of places, what I call the fallacy of measurement, to take something easy to measure and then, because it doesn't require any work to think how you might measure that, decide that's the thing, and that's what we're going to go for. And I think that is what happened with the GDP paradigm. You know, people were not clear how they would measure more intangible aspects of quality of life, but they thought they could measure GDP, and so they focused on that rather than what they should do and what we now have been doing with our Human Development and Capability Association, devoting a lot of effort to how you measure these other things, what are good proxies for human capabilities in a wide range of areas? And, and so um, that's, uh, I think we can't get, get away from the demand for measurement, nor in a way should we, because a developing country can't just um, you know, allow itself to, to go, I mean, we can't just allow the leaders to say we're advancing without showing anything. But what um, Sen and the other people who founded the Human Development Reports did was to say, if we package the measurement in a new form and we give more weight to education, health, and so on, then there'll be a different ranking and people will begin to ask questions and they'll want their country to advance. And then, you know, as the years go on, they add new tables. For example, the one that's uh, the gender development index shows how you rank if we now correct for certain kinds of gender imbalances. And all of a sudden, Japan, which was number one, would go down to number 20. And so, well, it puts people on notice. And actually, now Japan doesn't go down to number 20. And I think that shaming had, had a big effect on certain policy choices. So I think measurement is inevitable. It's part of the world that we're in. But the measurement has to have behind it a kind of humane thinking, which economics in its origins always had. I mean, after all, uh, Adam Smith and other uh, 18th century economists were humanists, and they really thought about sympathy. And so Sen uh, has always felt that it's crucial for the economist to be a philosopher and a humanist and to talk about sympathy and to talk about public culture and, and so on. Of course, he was a student in that Tagore school that I mentioned, so he got that early on. And his mother was one of the great historians of that school and wrote a wonderful book about how through dance, Tagore empowered women in the early parts of the 20th century. So anyway, um, coming out of that tradition, he has been a humanistic economist. And he even resisted the Human Development Index because he said, how can you have a single number? You know, because it's much more complicated than that. But then Mahbub ul Haq, the Pakistani economist who was head of the U UN um, Human Development Program, said, well, you know, it may be that the real story is, of course, more complicated, but unless you give a single number, politicians will not pay attention to it. So what you want is a single number that's new, that ranks nations in a new way. Then let's hope they won't just read page one of the reports, then they read, uh, go behind it and, and read a far more complex story. And of course, by now we do have 800 people in 80 countries who are members of this Human Development and Capability Association, and many of them are working on measurement. So I think, you know, we can't just say no, no measurement, but you have to do better measurement. And I think that's true with no no child left behind. That is to say, I think that the motivation was inequality. 
And that, that's important. And it's important to try, have some way of assessing how schools are doing. But then you have to look for the right things. And there are lots and lots of people working on this. At the Spencer Foundation in Chicago, there's whole projects working on how we could get better, more nuanced, more humanistic measures of academic performance. Now, of course, in the end of the day, it's going to be much more labor intensive because it'll require people to go in and watch teaching be done. But, but anyway, I think that's the right answer rather than just saying all testing is bad. I, I think, you know, if you don't have confidence in the people who are making the measures, as often you <laughs> don't, then it's better not to have the test at all. But still, you, you know, the best of all would, would be to have a, a good set of people-sensitive measures that would put the accent on the right things because you really do want, I mean, you don't want inner city children to be told, well, critical thinking and imagining is not for you because you're poor. That's why I use the choir example. So, so and that, that could so easily happen if you don't have the right kind of measure. So I think that should be the goal, to get the right kind of assessment system. And we can, I mean, they, it can be done. For example, the A-levels in Britain, I mean, Britain is very bad on many things, but in high school, philosophy is taught as an A-level subject, and there are national tests in philosophy, and they are very good. They are essay tests, and they get a large battery of people to both make up and then grade those tests. And of course, they have to pay them stuff, but, but they do it very well. Ireland now has just revised its high school curriculum to put in a lot more philosophy and critical thinking. And once again, it's going to be on a test, but it's going to be an essay test in which people, I discovered to my horror that some of my work is on this syllabus. And so, um, and, and the question that they're going to get is, think about problem so-and-so from the point of view of one of the following five thinkers, and my name was on that list. So I just know I'm going to get emails ahead of time by, from Irish kids who are going to say, how would you think about this and this and this? Um, but anyway, uh, you know, that, that's a good kind of question. It's a, a, a fantastic kind of question, only, of course, I can't uh, give them the answer. But, um, but so I, you know, that's testing, and it's good, and I mean, we all, assess our students and we all figure out good ways to do it and we don't say we can't do it so so I just think we have to do that on the national level oh well would it come thanks for your talk it's wonderful to have another scholar from Chicago here we had Jean Komaroff here about three oh, or four years great, ago great gave a wonderful lecture good. I teach a course here every couple of years on the history of modern India and invite, if not coerce, my students, some of which I think are here, to read Tagore. Oh, and I wonder great. if you could flesh out just a bit the colonial system of education that he was responding to <laughs> in his critiques of commercial man and then yeah. perhaps relate that to what I see as an increasing commodification of education here yeah. and to some extent in Europe as well. Education, maybe this is nostalgia, but my mother talks about this. She is a retired educator and education used to be thought of as a public good, not a private right. commodity to be bought and sold. And I wonder if the big attacks on the humanities are almost part and parcel of this commodification process. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. Well, you know, Tagore, I mean, the funny thing is that it all, to me, as a classicist, it kind of is, it has such a familiar air because it seems like the same struggle has to be fought again and again. The education system that Socrates was against was this one where everyone was memorizing everything and regurgitating it by rote. And we get a little window into it in Aristophanes' Clouds when he gives this rather comic but still probably quite accurate portrayal of the old education. Young men marched to school in a row and they all sang the same patriotic songs and so on. And so Socrates fought against that to, to the loss of his life. Then in the Roman Empire, Seneca all of a sudden is writing about liberal education. He was the one who coined that 
term, and he says, well, most people think liberalis means education for the liberal lace, which are the young gentlemen, but he said, no, he understands that word as, in terms of its root, free, and it's the education that makes you free. Well, the education for the young gentlemen was, once again, rote learning, you know, acculturation in a single tradition, no critical thinking, and then Seneca instead wants people to think for themselves and to become free. Tagore, you know, it's the same struggle. So the colonial system was, uh, and it wasn't um, only the, the British, I, I think it was true also of a lot of um, native Indian education, because after all, they couldn't attend a lot of the British education, uh, you know, it was rote learning. And he said that every school he went to, he couldn't stand. He, he never went to school. Now, he was lucky, of course, that his family was rich and his homeschooling was very successful. Uh, if we have Rick Santorum's result, uh, we will not find that that produces a good result for society. Um, but in any case, um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that homeschooling is the solution, but uh, he decided to have a school that did not kill the spirit, but that tapped the roots of the child's own passion, poetic capacity, creativity, while at the same time imparting discipline. And this is, of course, where the arts are so marvelous, because when you're learning to dance, you're learning discipline, but at the same time, you're able to express yourself. And uh, the book that uh, Martia Sand's mother wrote about dance in the school is called Joy in All Work. And they were working. They did a lot of work. And they worked hard to dance and do sing and, and do all the things that they otherwise did in school. But, but they did it with joy because the spillover from the arts infused all the rest of the education. And he wasn't alone. I mean, he was in conversation with other progressive educators. Leonard Elm Elmhurst, who founded Dartington Hall in England, spent a lot of time in Shantaniketan working with Tagore, and that's what led him to set up Darting Dartington Hall, which still exists and is still a wonderful arts-oriented school. But also Maria Montessori corresponded with Tagore, and you know, even though her own conception is a little more rigid and maybe too rigid. Nonetheless, what she was fighting against was far more rigid. And, you know, she, um, she said it's uh, when, when children had back problems from sitting in desks for so long all day, what did the educators think? They thought, oh, we better get an orthopedic desk. And she said, why didn't they think that maybe children should actually move around and they shouldn't be uh, sitting all day? Same time, John Dewey, on my home turf, uh, wanted a school where he'd be happy to send his kids. And that, by the way, was Tagore's motivation as well. And so he created the, the lab school where children were not sitting all day, but they were learning through activity, through doing, through asking questions. So there's a lot of synergy among all these movements. Another one was Pestalozzi in Switzerland, who um, wrote a novel, Leonard and Gertrude, about, so he, he's a little earlier, he's late 18th, early 19th century, but this, in Leonard and Gertrude, he talks about kids of the elites in Germany were all learning by rote learning, and it was very terrible. But Gertrude, this simple village woman, is a much better educator because she teaches children to learn while they're active. It's very Dewey-like because they're weaving and spinning and they're doing other craft things while they're learning math and reading and so on. So there are a lot of people talking about these things and they were in conversation with each other. And I actually think, you know, and Bronson Alcott in the US was another big one um, along these lines, that this has actually had a lasting impact on American education. Great vice of Tagore was that he was unwilling to trust others. So when he went away, and he did travel a lot, he wouldn't put anyone else in charge of the school, and he allowed himself to be revered as a kind of guru. You know, people would kiss his feet and so on which I think was in some ways inspiring, no doubt, but it was in some deeper way wrong, because then nothing else could happen except a museum of Tagore, and the school kind of ground to a halt with his death, and it's not a, a living place where new dances are being created, but they just perform Tagore's dances. 
and it's um, it's a little bit like the Martha Graham dance company. I mean, we want what's gone wrong with that? If you know, I mean, that the power of a single personality prevented new creativity from coming in there. Whereas Dewey had, didn't have that. I mean, he didn't have the charisma of Tagore, but he also didn't have the controlling um, tendencies of Tagore, and so he was willing to franchise his ideas far and wide and let other people run with them. And I think every American school today. You know, children are putting on plays, they're asking questions about where products come from. All of this stuff was Dewey, and it wasn't there in America, much, except in Alcott's school before Dewey. So I think, you know, things did change, and they have changed for the better. The danger is that this testing will narrow it and squeeze out those things, and I think we do see that happening all over the place. So, so I think that is a huge danger, but, but I would, I would say in India, it's gone further simply because government schools never were touched by Tagore because he didn't really, he didn't really want his ideas to be there. He, he was too jealous of his ideas. So, um, so that's, a, that's a real problem. His ideas are quite alive and well in Calcutta private schools as I saw, because it's the 150th anniversary of Tagore's birth, so they're doing a lot of things. And I was in a gathering in Calcutta of about 200 school children came together to talk about what Tagore means to them. And, you know, clearly they were all in the spirit of Tagore, and not just for the one occasion. But I think it doesn't spill over into government schools, and, um, and it doesn't go much beyond that region either. So um, I think he failed in that part of his program. He did much better with the songs that he created because those songs are sung all over India and in Bangladesh too. And he did much more with culture shaping through that medium than he did in a lasting way than through the school. Uh, thank you so much for your intellectually stimulating um, lecture. I really appreciated it. I, uh, I'm not sure if you've written on this subject, probably, so forgive me. Um, I'm wondering about your thoughts on new communication technologies and their, the potential, for the possibilities of liberal arts and humanities education that you're talking about. I recognize that the uh, new uh, technologies are interrelated with business and cultural changes. Uh, I've read, uh, read a couple of things uh, in the Chronicle a few years ago, one piece about study habits and how, I don't know if it was an empirical study, but maybe a commentary on students' study habits are changing and, and it's less uh, sustained focus on one topic. I mean, it makes sense in the era of multitasking as well. But that is radically different than uh, you know many, many people's experiences, perhaps. Uh, but also, just maybe the last week I read about, um, in the, also in the Chronicle, of, uh, of some graduate programs are eliminating the d uh, doctoral dissertation, just you know, and going to shorter, shorter pieces. And I, I don't know if that's uh, overblown, if that's maybe just happening at one or so programs. But there are risks uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, concerns about the uh, impacts on the sust ability for sustained thought and yeah. writing. And so I just wondered, it, yeah. you know, what your thoughts on are on that for the possibilities that you're discussing. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. This is huge. So I will only be able to pick a few little examples of your issues to focus on. I mean, first of all, I, I guess the dissertation, I think, is a separate issue, be partly because if you go back in history, if you look at German dissertations of the 19th century, and that was a book-oriented culture, if anyone was, they're 50 pages long. I mean, Karl Marx's doctoral dissertation, excellent treatment of Epicurus and so on, but it's very short, it's like an article. So, I mean, in short, it's not a unilinear thing. I think dissertation sort of swelled up and up, and I don't think it's so terrible that there should be, three, we give a three essay option and we always have to graduate students who want to have some articles that they could publish. So I think we'd have to look at each field and think what makes sense in that field. And, and I wouldn't immediately assume that the very long, you know, 600 page or whatever dissertations are the best way. Um, maybe there's some, 
balance we could strike. But, but no, new technology, I guess I have one thing about the internet and one thing about reading. The internet, I think, is very complicated in its relation to democracy because on the one hand, it provides a huge possibilities for people to discuss publicly with each other across differences of region, class, nation, the international women's movement would never have been possible without the internet. However, partly because of the very widespread anonymity on blogs and, and websites, which is different from print journalism, where you know if you write a letter to the editor, you gotta have a name and a contact address and so on. But if you wanna comment on some blog post that somebody has, even if it's done by the New York Times, you can be completely anonymous. And uh, therefore, I, I think it does bear out, in my experience anyway, the point I made earlier that people behave worse under shelter of anonymity than when they're held personally accountable. A colleague and I edited a volume which you might find interesting called The Offensive Internet Speech, Privacy, and Reputation. So it's edited by Saul Levmore, who is the former dean of our law school, and by me. And uh, it was all about bullying and harassment on the internet, particularly spurred by an incident where there was a website that purported to give advice about law school admissions, but it quickly degenerated into being named law, female law students being woven into pornographic scenarios by anonymous people, people who clearly knew them because they would give physical details, but you couldn't tell who it was and there was no accountability. So these women whose job possibilities were genuinely hurt by that uh, because firms, of course, will Google you and if the first thing that comes up is something obscene, they, that, that taints you in their mind even if they don't believe it. They, so the women sued for defamation, but they didn't have any defendants. So they would sue these pseudonyms, you know, and that therefore they really couldn't recover. So that's a real problem. And what our authors in the volume are advocating is much more accountability requirements for genuine, you know, IP address uh, for, for posting of that sort. Now, some blog, people who run blogs do that out of personal responsibility, but many others don't. So, so that's one, one aspect of it, and I, I would say that in terms of critical thinking and philosophical argument, it's very, very disappointing. I wrote a piece that was about the various arguments used in defending bans of the Muslim burqa, and it was in the opinionator section of the New York Times, which is among internet things the most one of the most highbrow that you could get, and they take comments, and there were 700 comments on my piece, and they sent me, I said, I just not, can't read all of them, but if you send me the 100 most interesting, I'm gonna read them and reply to them. So bear in mind, they've made a selection that these are the 100 most interesting. I would say that there were three that made an argument, and most were just sounding off and not engaging with the arguments that I put out. And if a student had reacted that way, they, they wouldn't have done well in the class. And you, you, you know. So, so it kind of encourages the haste and the sloppiness and the sloganeering, even though it also has the potentiality for something better. So I think we have to see both sides and try to figure out what, what we can do to bring out the best. So then, but the other thing that, uh, that I wanted to say is reading. I, I think it is distressing that young people spend much less time reading. I've noticed even in my own teaching career that the reading skills of the people I teach, and these are at very elite institutions, have declined. It's harder to assign a novel by Henry James than it was before. Uh, so, you know, that is partly because so much of the time is spent with the internet and with video games and other things like that, and um, people are not spending time reading. Now, technology also has the potentiality to increase reading. I personally read, in quotes, a lot more novels than I ever at any time in my life did because I now subscribe to Audible and I listen to audiobooks while I'm running. And so I go through many, many 
novels and novelists. I'm now into Mrs. Gaskell, whom I never read in my life, you know. But you can just listen, and a novel of Mrs. Gaskell might take you approximately 30 hours. And so just think, you know, in a couple of weeks of running, you go through that novel. And so, so that's time that otherwise you would not be using reading. So there is potentiality on both sides, I think, with all of these technologies. And what we really need to think hard about is how to try to bring out the best potentialities. One more short answer. Short answer, okay. and then I then I want yeah. the last word. All right. Okay. One more. One more. Short answer. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Real mm -hmm. quick. We can talk more out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, mine is um, a little bit different question. Um, I'm not trying to draw attention away from the conclusion, you know, that we need to um, pay attention to uh, concerned citizens and whatnot. But um, I was concerned with, um, and I do this often too, and I hear it a lot. This idea of human dignity. You, you talked that it was your kind of, I think you said your first, kind of like your first premise. Um, I was wondering if you could just comment on what you would say is the actual foundation of such a thing. What can we point to and say that's mm -hmm. the foundation of human dignity? I don't know. I hear a lot oh of, gosh. I think, yeah. Rawls and maybe a bit of Kant in your talk. So yeah, yeah, yeah. what exactly is that foundation? What could we point to exactly? Well, if I were to be really brief, I would just say the President's Council on Bioethics has a volume on human dignity in which I have a art, longish article in which I answer that question. So, uh, but I think it's very important that dignity is not a self-evident concept, but it's something that needs to be defined in its relationship to a whole family of principles and other concepts, such as the concept of respect, principles of justice. So I'm basically agreeing with Rawls that we shouldn't think of it as foundational in the sense that it's self-evident. And I think whenever that approach is taken, then, you know, when people say, oh, this violates human dignity as though that's a debate stopper and they don't have to say anything more, I think that's bad argument. I think this particularly because I think some classic ways of finding the foundation of human dignity are, uh, give very bad results for theories of justice. For example, the most common way is to think that the foundation of human dignity is in rationality, and of course that's meant that we don't acknowledge the equal dignity of people with severe cognitive impairments. But then, I mean, since I also think animals have dignity of their own kind, I mean, that there's different kinds of dignity, I think it's also very important not to have a foundation that sharply separates the human from other animals. So um, what do I think? I think it's something having to do with striving and effort to attain a goal that makes a being an object of respect and a, 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 a person, so to speak, rather than a thing, although, I mean, person can not, doesn't have to be just human, um, you know, and makes, it makes a being a subject of justice. Why is it an issue of justice, how we treat a person with severe cognitive impairments? Because that being is alive, is trying to do something, is trying to attain Goals. So that's the area in which I would locate that. So that, is, that means that if there is a human creature who is not engaging, who's, not, who's irremediably incapable of striving, such as someone in a really permanent vegetative condition, I would think that's outside the purview of human dignity. Uh, that's the consequence of my view, which then one might dispute. Uh, of course, if that turns out never, not to be so permanent, as, as might be the case, then that's another story. Um, an anencephalic child might not be a being of human dignity. I mean, if there's no capacity for any kind of striving, but, you know, somebody like um, the philosopher Eva Cate describes her daughter, Sesha, who has no measurable IQ, but who hugs her parents, who dances, sways to music, and so, right, to me, she has fully equal dignity with the smartest academic. Uh, so the rationality criterion is one I think is very important to get rid of. Thank you, Professor Nussbaum, for a delightful 
and stimulating evening, and thank you all for coming. Um, we do have some of her books uh, in the lobby, and I think she will sign them yes. if you buy one. Uh, so that's a possibility. We also have another sign-up sheet for any of you who aren't on our mailing list and would like to be. Uh, you can do that, and we have some refreshments out there for, for the body, not only for the soul. Uh, we're going to talk about this again on Tuesday evening at Pilgrim Congregational Church at 7 p.m., and I thank publicly the people at Pilgrim. I don't know where they are, but they, I know they were here. And so for opening up your church for us, and thanks again, uh, Larry Goodwin, President Goodwin, for taking some time to help us sort this out. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.